I just want to welcome everybody along this evening to our meeting. It's great to see so many people here for the second of our lectures and our services. And I want to just thank everyone for uh, coming along this evening. Just on behalf of the Culture Society, I want to wish you, uh, or thank you very much for coming. It's tremendous to have with us the Reverend David Silverside from Loch Brickland Reformed Presbyterian Church. Uh, I, I know there has been others and myself have been looking forward to this evening for quite a while and we're very glad to have you here uh, this evening. Uh, just at the start of, uh, of the meeting tonight, I want to read, if, if anybody remembers, it's the same part of the psalm that we read uh, at the last meeting before uh, the, the, the meeting then. And I came round to my own daily readings today, the psalm I was reading, so I feel I can uh, read this again. Uh, and it's there at the, the end of the Psalm 71, and it says, O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also when I am old and grey-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to every one that is to come. Uh, that is why we are here, is to remember what God has done in years gone by and how he has worked and tell it to another generation. I have to include myself, but until recently I maybe didn't know just as much as I should have about this particular subject. But I think I have uh, uh, spoken long enough now, and I'm going to ask, um, hand over to Mr. Silverside, and, and you can conduct the meeting however you, you like, and, and it's up to you now. And we're, we're, We are completely in your hands now, so thank you very much. <coughs> Well, I'm glad to be here, and I appreciate the warm welcome, and uh, be as I'm amongst friends. Perhaps we could be, be, begin with a word of prayer, shall we pray? O gracious and eternal God, we bless thee that we can draw near to thee through the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we uh, spend this time in the uh, recollection of thy doings in former days, that thou wilt grant to us thy blessing to apply thy truth to our hearts even in our day, that we might live by the word of God and uh, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So grant thy blessing to us and leave us not to ourselves, but accept us and take away our sins, and all for Christ's sake. Amen. But I could also read from the Psalms in the second Psalm, reading the second Psalm, Why rage the heathen, or sorry, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. And yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and he perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Amen. Thus far we read the word of God, and that psalm uh, uh, is very much at the heart of our subject this evening. Our subject is, well I've given it the brief title, The Covenants and the Covenanters, 
and uh, we're really looking and, and, and Robert asked me to look at the National Covenant of Scotland in, of 1638 and the Solemn League and Covenant of England, Scotland and Ireland of 1643. Now it's very difficult to uh, go into any detail and still cover all the ground uh, in, uh, that, that we need to cover. So what I'm giving you this evening is a very, a very broad uh, picture of that particular period. And we hope to cover six things. The general background from the Reformation. Secondly, the National Covenant of Scotland. Thirdly, the Solemn League and Covenant. Fourthly, the Solemn League and Covenant in Ireland. Fifthly, the, uh, the time from the Solemn League and Covenant to the Revolution Settlement. And then finally, some applications for today. So first of all, the general background from the Reformation. The Protestant Reformation from Popery to Biblical Christianity had come to Scotland under the blessing of God and by means of the leadership of John Knox, who died in 1572, and the work was carried on by many men, but especially Andrew Melville, who himself drew up what is known as the King's Covenant in 1581. Uh, the practice of uh, entering into covenants, binding promises and obligations, uh, binding oneself to the Lord, uh, this is not, it didn't start with the period known as the covenanting period. There were many covenants uh, at the time of the Reformation. And conflict between the Presbyterian General Assembly and King James I uh, began in 1618 with the, what were called the Five Articles of Perth, uh, where the King was seeking to overthrow Presbyterianism, and uh, his son, Charles I, carried on in similar vein, seeking to reverse much of the ground gained in Scotland uh, through the Reformation. The work of the Reformation was constantly attacked, especially between 1567 and 1637. Uh, I suppose many of us have heard the uh, tale of Jenny Geddes and uh, throwing her stool when the dean tried to read the service book in Edinburgh and she said villain wilt thou say mass in my love and that uh, took place as, as the tension between uh, the king and his representatives in church and state trying to suppress Presbyterianism uh, and uh, uh, trying to impose uh, the Anglican prayer book and so on uh, was reaching its height. Archbishop Lord attempted to impose a book of liturgy and uh, also meetings of Presbyterian church sessions and presbyteries were declared illegal. And so things were reaching a crescendo as it were and in due time by the blessing of God the Presbyterian people responded uh, very clearly by swearing the National Covenant of Scotland in 1638. And that brings us then to our second point, the National Covenant of Scotland, the National Covenant of Scotland 1638. The period between 1637 and 1651 is frequently known as the Second Reformation in Scotland. And the conflict that had been mounting reached a climax when in 1638 multitudes gathered in Greyfriars Church in Edinburgh to sign the National Covenant of Scotland. This covenant pledged those who 
swore it or signed it, signed it to uphold the Reformed faith and worship and in particular it acknowledged Christ as rightful king over all and as the king who should be acknowledged by all that no human activity can be rightly engaged in independently of submission to Christ. That means secondly the individual as a sinner is to acknowledge the kingship of Christ by turning from his sin and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to take away his sin and bowing the knee to him as his Lord. Thirdly, the church as a body, as an organized body, is to acknowledge Christ as king over her by submitting to Christ and to the scriptures as his word and therefore uh, submitting to the biblical form of church government which they regarded and many of us do too I'm sure uh, as Presbyter the Presbyterian form of church government and that God was to be worshipped only in the manner appointed by himself in the scriptures so the principle known as the regulative principle of worship which Knox held to and which lay behind the reformation of worship in Scotland was that nothing was to be introduced into the worship of God except that which God himself appointed. In other words not only what God condemns in scripture is to be excluded from worship but all that God does not appoint in worship is to be excluded from worship. We are to worship God God's way and in no other way whatsoever. And then the fourth thing is that the state, that is civil rulers and a nation, as it, the, the state is distinct from the church, the state does not govern the church, but the state is still to acknowledge submission to Christ. Christ is the prince of the kings of the earth and so whilst church and state are distinct and the state is not to govern the church yet the state is to submit to Christ and the scriptures and so the nation is to be governed according to the scriptures. If I may just briefly sum up the different views on the relationship between church and state. The Roman Catholic view is that the church governs the state. For, for, for Roman Catholics the church, uh, church authority resides particularly in the papacy. We don't accept that but that's the Roman Catholic position. And uh, the papacy, uh, the Pope is not only meant to be the vicar of Christ and head of the church but also the ruler of the world and the father of princes so that the papacy claims not only power in the church but power over civil government as well so the Roman Catholic view is that the church governs the state and nothing is Christian unless the, unless the church that is the papacy governs it a Christian nation is a papally governed nation. A Christian school is a church controlled school. A Christian hospital is a church controlled hospital or whatever. Uh, that for something to be Christian it has to come under the jurisdiction of what Roman Catholics believe is the church. That's the Roman Catholic view. The Erastian view uh, it's known as the Erastian view named after uh, a man called Erastus is the reverse and on this view the state governs the church or at least if the state if the government professes to be Christian then the state governs the church that's what you have for example in the case of the Church of England where the monarch is regarded as the head of the church that's the Erastian view that the state governs the church then there's another view, voluntaryism, uh, 
that this view is that state and church are not only separate, but they have nothing whatever to do with each other. That isn't what the Covenanters believed either. What the Covenanters believed was this. The church and the state are separate, separate spheres with their own distinct office bearers. The church doesn't control the state, the state doesn't control the church. But they do have obligations to each other. So that they both are to submit to Christ. The church is to submit to Christ in doing what Christ has appointed for the church and the state is to submit to Christ in doing what Christ has appointed in the scriptures for the state. And the church can teach the civil rulers his duty from the word of God and the state is to uphold God's moral law in the public domain and thus in that way pave the way for the church to perform its distinctive functions in the worship of God and the preaching of the gospel. So church and state are distinct. Both are to be under Christ, consciously under Christ and the scriptures and they have a duty to each other but neither controls the other. Now the national covenant reflected this view of church and state. It was drawn up by a minister, Alexander Henderson, and a lawyer, uh, Archibald Johnson, later Lord Warriston. And it was a legal and constitutional document and was based on the 1581 covenant that we mentioned earlier on. And in Greyfriars, uh, church, or sometimes it's maintained in the churchyard, but uh, it was sworn and taken by a, a huge number of people, by gentry, nobles, burgesses, ministers, and multitudes of the ordinary people. And then copies were sent throughout Scotland, and again, multitudes swore the National Covenant of Scotland, committing themselves to these principles and it was a truly national covenant. It was uh, a legal constitutional document of Scotland and it was also national in the sense of uh, a huge bulk of the people subscribed to it. The Episcopal Party, the High Church Party, were thunderstruck and appalled by this mass reaction. But the blessing of the Spirit of God had been accompanying the preaching of the Word and so the people were prepared and they rallied to the National Covenant. But the, the enemies of the Reformed faith were appalled at this uh, massive response to the National Covenant. On the 21st of November, 1638, the General Assembly met in Glasgow Cathedral and uh, there were 140 ministers, two professors and 98 ruling elders and uh, uh, Alexander Henderson was chosen to be moderator to chair the proceedings. The King's Commissioner, the Marquess of Hamilton, came and uh, to represent the King's interests and to defend the place of the bishops. And he was unsuccessful and therefore claimed royal authority to dissolve the assembly. The assembly promptly ignored him and carried on with its proceedings. And uh, the uh, Marquis of Hamilton, the King's Commissioner, left warning of dire consequences of what they were doing. The assembly carried on and proceeded to abolish the bishops and to maintain and establish Presbyterian church government. And uh, Alexander Henderson notably remarked in the assembly, we have pulled down the walls of Jericho, let him that rebuildeth beware of the curse of Heel the Bethlehemite. 
and uh, Samuel Rutherford, some of you may well have heard of, uh, he wrote to Alexander Henderson and whilst rejoicing over what had been accomplished, he nevertheless anticipated a reaction uh, that having stood for the truth, there would be a reaction that Satan and the, the evil hearts of ungodly men would be stirred to respond. And he wrote to Henderson, God hath called you to Christ's side. The wind is now in Christ's face in Scotland, and seeing ye are with him, ye cannot expect the lee side or the sunny side of the bray. The lee side, I understand, means the sheltered side. And Rutherford is saying in his quaint way that uh, this is Christ's cause and there will be opposition and you can't expect to be walking on the sheltered side out of the wind now that you're following after Christ in this way. The king's reaction was to try to implement Archbishop Lord's policies and uh, he sought to coerce the Scottish uh, Presbyterians into submission. And the bishops' wars took place. The wealthy bishops financed uh, the uh, attempts to coerce the Scots into the high church conformity. The covenanters were forced to take up arms and Henderson wrote a paper on in, uh, called Instruction for Defensive Arms. This brings us thirdly then. That's the National Covenant of Scotland, 1638. Thirdly, the Solemn League and Covenant of 1643. The Solemn League and Covenant in 1643. Whilst the king was concerned to try and bring Scotland into line, he was having problems nearer at home in England. By August 1642, the civil war in England between the parliamentary forces and the troops of Charles I was underway. What is known as the Long Parliament had removed the High Church Episcopacy, that's a government by bishops and a whole hierarchy, the, the whole pattern set out by Archbishop Lord and had been removed, but they hadn't really put anything in its place. This led to the Westminster Assembly. Parliament called an assembly of ministers, select, uh, ministers and also uh, selected members of the House of Lords and the House of Commons to settle the government of the Church of England and to revise the 39 articles of the Church of England. The king forbade this assembly, but it went ahead anyway, but many of the high churchmen did not appear. Many of those who believed in Episcopal church government by, by bishops and uh, maybe, maybe the Church of Ireland folk here this evening, I don't know. But uh, many of them didn't attend because the king uh, had said that the assembly should not take place. But the assembly did take place. But meanwhile, the parliamentary forces had suffered losses and needed the help of Scotland. So the Parliament forces looked to Scotland for help. Robert Bailey, one of the Scottish ministers, says the English were for a civil league, we for a religious covenant. That is, the English wanted the help of the Scottish army and to make a league but the Scots were looking for more. The Scots didn't have that much to gain by helping the English army, but they did so because they desired a thorough reformation of the English church to bring it in line with the word of God. And the result was the Solemn League and Covenant. The Solemn League and Covenant. The Solemn League and Covenant was sworn by all members of the Westminster Assembly, 
by the House of Lords and the House of Commons after a ser sermons preached by Philip Nye, one of the English ministers, and Alexander Henderson from Scotland. Later, it was uh, taken to Scotland and it was sworn by the whole of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland and also by the Scottish Parliament. Later, it was sworn by Charles II, the King, as King of Great Britain, France and Ireland. As a result of the Solemn League and Covenant, the Westminster Assembly had a much broader remit. Instead of simply looking at church government and revising the 39 articles, the Westminster Assembly was to draw up a new confession of faith, a catechism, a directory for worship, and a directory for church government. And the result of that was the Westminster Confession of Faith, and they didn't just settle for one catechism, they drew up two, the larger catechism and the shorter catechism. Most, if they're familiar with either, will be familiar with the shorter catechism. They drew up a directory of worship and a directory of church government. They also did the spade work on what, is, what became known as the Scottish Psalter, the Scottish Metrical Psalter. Another result of the Solemn League and Covenant, which committed England, Scotland and Ireland to seeking uniformity in the Reformed faith, was that the Scottish Church sent commissioners to the Westminster Assembly. Alexander Henderson, Samuel Rutherford, George Gillespie, Robert Bailey were ministers and two Scottish ruling elders, Archibald Johnson and Lord, and, uh, Lord Maitland, came to the Westminster Assembly. Well, what exactly does this covenant, what's it about? What does it say? Well, I've brought copies of it and there should be enough for everyone to take a copy from the table so you can read it at your leisure. But section 1 of the, of the Solemn League and Covenant uh, commits those who swore it or signed it to preserve the Reformed religion in Scotland in doctrine, worship, discipline and government and to seek the reformation of the church in England and Ireland. Uh, the king was king of Ireland as well as England and uh, to seek uniformity within the three kingdoms of England, Scotland and Ireland in biblical and reformed doctrine, church government, form of worship and catechizing. That's, that was the aim, that in England, Scotland and Ireland the church should have Biblical doctrine, a biblical confession of faith, biblical church government, biblical worship, and that there should be uniformity in the three kingdoms. The second section commits those who took it to seek the overthrow of all false religion and especially the extirpation of popery and prelacy. It doesn't say the extirpation of those who believe these things, but the extirpation of these things, popery and prelacy. Section 3 indicates that in our various callings, we will, they would uphold the rights of the monarch, of the parliaments and of the citizens, and especially would be loyal to the monarch in his preserving and defending the true religion. Fourthly, the fourth section expresses opposition to all who oppose the reformation of the church and the state, all who seek to foment div division contrary to this covenant. Section five, that they would seek to maintain the union of the three kingdoms. And section six, that they would give mutual support to all covenanters in seeking the aims of this covenant. 
Then there's confession of sin and humiliation for sin and the profession of a sincere desire uh, for the blessing of God and that other nations also would come into a like covenant as this. That's what the Solemn League and Covenant uh, contains. We believe it's biblical. I'm a minister in the Covenant of Church, so you would expect me to say that, and I do believe it's biblical. It is biblical for individuals and nations to enter into covenant with God. God's covenant of grace with men in Christ is to be responded to and on an individual level but also on a national level. God's covenant of grace is God prom promising to be the God of his people who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He binds himself by his own promise he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. That's the Westminster Confession on God's covenant with man. And God's covenant with man, the truth of it is to be received and just as God says to his people, I am thy God in his covenant, so his people are to say, we are thy people, and to bind themselves to be the, the Lord's people, and to glorify God. And there are biblical examples of uh, entering into covenant with God. You find them in Joshua 24, Second Chronicles 15, 2 Kings 11, and also in Nehemiah. And the content of the covenant was biblical. The Bible teaches that the church, that Christ is the head of the church, and that the church is to do what Christ says it will do. People treat the church as if it was just a social club, or just like, a, like uh, some... Uh, a voluntary society, a golf club or something of that sort and we just make the rules up ourselves. That's not what the church is. It's Christ's church. Christ is the king of the church. And at the end of Matthew's gospel, Christ said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even in, unto the end of the world. That's what the church should be doing. Christ is its king and head. The office bearers of the church are to teach people to do what Christ says. And uh, the worship of the church, the discipline of the church, the government of the church is to be according to Christ's appointment in his own word. And in that way, the church is what the Bible calls the pillar and ground of the truth, holding up the truth in a fallen world. And so the church is to submit to Christ and if, if the church in every place submits to Christ, well, uniformity will be the result. They'll all be doing the same thing. So the idea of uniformity in England, Scotland, Ireland was quite right. Follow the scriptures and there'll be uniformity. There'll be harmony. And as far as the state is concerned, were the covenanters right to say that even civil government should submit to Christ? Well, they were. There can be no legitimate... If Christ is king over all, and he is, then there can be no legitimate activity amongst men that ignores the authority of Christ. And so when men ask, when men are in power in the state, the first thing they should be asking is, what does King Jesus require civil rulers, kings, princes, members of parliament, whatever, what does King Jesus require us to do? That's, that's how a country should be governed. 
by the Bible being acknowledged as the word of God and that Christ must be honoured even in the civil realm. And of course the Bible teaches that, uh, that, they, that, men, that, that the civil ruler is to punish evildoers. That's his fundamental function, to punish evildoers. If he doesn't punish evildoers, he's a failure. It's an act of rebellion against God and against his Christ. That's why in Psalm 2, it, it, at verse 10, it says, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. That's, that's talking about kings as kings. Kissing the Son, that means acknowledging the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of the earlier verses in that psalm are quoted in Acts chapter 4 about Pilate and the, the Jewish rulers and uh, Herod, how they opposed the Lord Jesus Christ, not just as individuals but as rulers. By contrast, this is saying that they must honour the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as the rulers who crucified the Lord Jesus opposed him, so it is the duty of rulers to do the exact opposite of that and acknowledge him as king at the right hand of God. So church and state are distinct, but they both must submit to Christ. And the covenanters saw these covenants as binding not only the nation, but future generations of the, na the three kingdoms, England, Scotland, and Ireland. You say, how can that be? How can it be that we are bound by a covenant that was entered into centuries ago? Well, the Bible does teach that in the book of uh, Judges, uh, book of Joshua, you find that the Gibeonites, not in the most straightforward manner, but they, they got Joshua and the princes of Israel to swear by the Lord that they wouldn't harm them. And then in the days of Saul, centuries later, when Saul began to uh, afflict the, Gideonite, the, the Gibeonites, God judged because of the oath taken generations earlier in the days of Joshua. And it wasn't all the people that took the oath. It was only the leaders, but they did so as leaders. So that what those leaders did on behalf of Israel in entering into that oath was binding on all the people of that day and all subsequent generations and God held them to it and in the book of Ezekiel we find that even a covenant entered into under pressure when Zedekiah uh, king Zedekiah the king of Judah swore to Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon that he wouldn't rebel against him swore in the name of the Lord when he did rebel the Lord punished him even though he'd taken that oath under coercion, the Lord still held him to it. So if you want the biblical references, uh, I can give you, give you them later. So the covenant has held that these covenant, that, that the solemn league and covenant entered into by the king and by the parliaments on behalf of England, Scotland, Ireland, bound those kingdoms perpetually to honour Christ as the rightful king over them. And uh, the fact that many people took them insincerely doesn't alter that. The covenants stand. So that these three kingdoms are to this day under obligation to honour Christ. That's true anyway of any nation. 
but it's all the more true of a nation that once did so and swore that it would continue to do so. Fourthly then, the Solemn League and Covenant in Ireland. The Solemn League and Covenant in Ireland. The, in the early 1600s, the plantations of English and Scottish settlers in the northern parts of Ireland consisted largely of ungodly people. That's true of the Scottish settlers as well. Sometimes it's a bit romanticized as if uh, some fine people came over here uh, as the planters. That's not true. A lot of them were rogues and scoundrels and on the run and had very good reasons for wanting to get out, out of the, their home country. There were a bunch of rogues by and large. But the Lord in his grace caused that several godly ministers from Scotland came and preached the gospel to this assortment of scoundrels and runaways and so on. People like Robert Blair, who settled in Bangor in 1623. Josias Welsh, who preached in Temple Patrick and was known as the Cock of the Conscience. Josias Welsh was a grandson of John Knox, and he's buried in Temple Patrick in the old churchyard there. You can go and see his grave. Uh, and he was a grandson. He was a son of a daughter of John Knox, the great reformer. John Livingston in Kilinchy. John Livingston was, is best known for the sermon that he preached when in Scotland he preached at Kirkershots on the text from Ezekiel 36. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and a new heart also will I give you. I will take out the heart of stone and put in the heart of flesh. And uh, through that one sermon, it's reckoned that 500 people were converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he did have a similar time of blessing, I think when he was preaching in Hollywood, here in, in, over on this side of the water, where the Spirit of God worked mightily, bringing many to faith in the Saviour. In 1641, the Scottish army arrived to deal with a rebe the rebellion, and with all the Scottish soldiers, this led to the organization of a formal presbytery uh, in 1642. And th throughout that period, there was great harmony among the ministers as they worked together and preached the word and the blessing of God was upon their labors. Well, you remember that in 1643 in London, the Solemn League and Covenant was sworn by the Houses of Parliament, by the Westminster Assembly, then in Scotland by the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland and the Scottish Parliament. Well, in 1644, the General Assembly of the Scottish Church sent four ministers to the northern parts of Ireland uh, to explain the Solemn League and Covenant and to supervise the swearing of it by people in the northern parts of Ireland and to preach the word of God. And this they did. They preached the, the word of God, they explained the Solemn League and Covenant and multitudes of people signed the Solemn League and Covenant in the northern parts of Ireland. I say the northern parts because obviously the border didn't exist then and it isn't it, did not, it was signed by large numbers in some places that are actually now in the Irish Republic. In the spring of 1644, these men came and preached, and at Carrickfergus, a thousand soldiers and citizens swore the Solemn League and Covenant, followed by large numbers in Comber, Newton Arch, Bangor, Broad Island, Island McGee, then in Antrim, Ballymena, Coleraine, uh, in uh, Coleraine, I think it was, after the long, they spent a long time with preaching and the service of worship, they swore the covenant, but the people didn't want to go home. They stayed on for more prayers and singing of psalms after the 
formal worship was over. And uh, in uh, Dunluis and at uh, what is now called Londonderry, uh, two of the Scottish ministers, William Adair and John Weir, uh, met opposition in, in what was then simply called Derry from the mayor and from Colonel Mervyn. But the crowds listened to the preaching of the word and they swore the covenant in the marketplace. In Rathole, now in County Donegal, a large crowd, uh, so many people came that one minister, one of the Scottish ministers, preached inside the church building and one preached outside to the people who couldn't get in. And multitudes swore the solemn league and covenant, committing themselves to the Protestant Reformed religion and to the acknowledgement of that in church and state. The same in Letterkenny and then in Ray, in Ray apparently, so one, man, one minister preached inside, one outside. There were so many people uh, in uh, Enniskillen. Uh, everyone took the covenant except for one conforming minister who stuck to the Episcopal ways. And then uh, they had a, a communion in Derry Cathedral. Uh, they took the altar out and used a communion table and had a Presbyterian communion service with multitudes of people. And yet, even though there were such vast crowds, the ministers and the elders examined them so that only those who had a credible profession of faith in Christ were allowed to take the Lord's Supper. Uh, the covenant was taken by many people in Ballycastle and then they returned back to the people in Antrim and in Down, County Down, preaching and exhorting the people. And then we met up with a third minister, a man called Hamilton, and observed the Lord's Supper in Newton Arch, in Hollywood, in Ballywalter, and even down in Dublin, there were a fair number of people who signed the Solemn League and Covenant. So, the Solemn League and Covenant was very much a reality in this part of the world. It's largely forgotten now, but in those days, multitudes signed it or else swore it by lifting up their hand. And uh, it's often forgotten that for a period of time, all ministers, in the pre all Presbyterian ministers in Ireland had to swear the Solemn League and Covenant before they would be ordained. People don't realize that, but it is the case. The whole Presbyterian body was covenanter in the, that, at that time. Well, fifthly, we'll hurry on, the time's going. From the Solemn League and Covenant to the Revolution Settlement, what was happening? Between 1643 or 44 over here, when people signed or swore the Solemn League and Covenant, on to the Revolution Settlement in 1688 under William, King William of Orange. Well, in Scotland during this period, uh, Charles II, James II, persecuted the Presbyterians, persecuted the people of God. Hundreds were banished, uh, others, some were banished to America, some to the Northern Isles of Scotland. Th over three and a half thousand were imprisoned or outlawed or threatened, sentenced to death in their absence. Hundreds were killed, some with trial, some without trial. About 7,000 left Scotland. simply because they adhered to the Solemn League and Covenant and wouldn't accept that the king should govern the church. Even Christians today wouldn't understand this, that these things mattered so much. Christ's glory was involved. Christ had the right to say who governs the church, and it's not the king. And so they'd, they'd lose their lives 
rather than give way to the king governing the church. And uh, anyone who refused to, on, when the, the, there were times, particularly 1685 to 1688, were called the killing times in Scotland. And uh, the, the it, refusal to disavow the solemn league and covenant could mean you would be shot on the spot. That's what it came to. The aim was to obliterate reformed religion. Those who wouldn't refuse it and disavow it, they wanted to destroy them. So you had men like John Brown of Priest Hill, who is his uh, cottage out in the, on the moors. He was there with his wife, his family, and Claver House, his soldiers came and shot him dead in front of his wife and family. And yet he faced it, he knelt down and prayed, knowing that he was going to die, in the confidence that he belonged to Christ. And his poor widow said she thought more of him now than she ever did. She said, uh, she, the clever house uh, in charge of the soldiers said, what do you think of him now? She said, I, I, I thought well of him, but I thought even more of him now. And so many of the Covenanters were taken to the grass market in Edinburgh and hanged. And some of them, the ministers especially, they exhorted the people as they stood on the scaffold before the noose was put round their neck and they exhorted the people to trust in the Lord, for those who didn't know the Saviour, to seek him, and for the people to be steadfast in the truth of God. They sang psalms, they read the scriptures, they prayed, and then they faced death. And as citizens, they sought to defend the covenanted constitution of Scotland. Sometimes the covenanters are, are pictured as if they believe the church should take up arms. That's not the thing at all. Scotland had a covenanted Christian constitution. As citizens, they were defending it against the outlaws and ultimately they declared the king to be an outlaw. He swore the covenant, that's how he became king. When he broke it, he ceased to be king. He was an outlaw, a criminal. As members of Christ's church, they met on the hills and on the moors to worship God and to hear his ministers preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The ministers, the faithful ministers, kept preaching, knowing that if they were caught, they would be put to death, and some of them would be tortured, and some of them were tortured before they were put to death. One minister, Donald Cargill, rode with other covenanting Christians into Torwood and pronounced in the name of Christ an excommunication of the king and of several of the nobles that supported the king. He actually excommunicated them from the church of God. Several reasons were given. Their contempt of the gospel their breaking of the solemn league and covenant. In the case of the king, one of the reasons given for excommunicating him was that he pardoned murderers. Cargill excommunicated the king and one of the reasons was that only God had the right, even in civil justice, to pardon a murderer but the king took it upon himself to do so. 
I don't know what they'd have made of today's situation. But let me give you an example. I know the time is going on and I don't want to wear you out. But let me give you an example of the preaching that took place on the hills and moors of Scotland at that time. Here is a sermon from Richard Cameron, or an extract from a sermon of Richard Cameron, preaching not that long before his death. He died young. Richard Cameron was ordained in Holland and by two Scottish ministers in exile and a Dutch, a Dutch minister. He came back to Scotland knowing that his ministry would be short and that in due time he would lay down his life for the gospel. And here he is preaching in the south of Scotland to a gathering, a huge gathering of people out on the moors. And his text was, Ye will not come unto me, that ye might have life. And he says this, But I say, our Lord is here this day, saying, Will ye take me, ye that have had a lie so long in your right hand? What say ye to it? You that have been plagued with deadness, hardness of heart and unbelief. He is now requiring you to give in your answer. What say ye, yes or no? What think ye of the offer? And what fault find ye in him? There may be some saying, if I get or take him, I shall get a cross also. Well, that is true, but ye will get a sweet cross. Thus we offer him unto you in the parishes of Auchinleck, Douglas, Crawford, John, and all ye that live thereabout. And what say ye? Will ye take him? Tell us what ye say, for we take instruments before these hills and mountains around us that we have offered him unto you this day. Ye that are free of cess paying, that's the tax for the persecution, will ye take him? Ye that are free of the bond now tendered by the enemies, will ye accept of him this day when the old professors are taking offence at his way and cross? Or will you cast your eyes upon him? Angels are wondering at this offer. They stand be beholding with admiration that our Lord is giving you such an offer this day. O oh, come, come then unto him, and there shall never be more of your bypass sins. They shall be buried. But if he will not come to him, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you. Now what say ye to me? And what shall I say to him that sent me unto you? Shall I say, Lord, there are some yonder saying, I am content to give Christ my heart, hand, house, lands, and all I have for his cause. If he can make a better bargain, then do it. Look over to the shore head and these hills, and take a look of them, for they are all witnesses now. And when you are dying, they shall come before your face. We take every one of you witness against the other, and will not that aggravate your sorrow when they come into your mind and conscience saying, We heard you invited and obtested to take Christ, and we are witnesses, and yet ye would not, and now we come in here as witnesses against you. There is some tenderness amongst you now, and that is favourable like to look upon, but yet that is not all. The angels will go up and report at the throne what is everyone's choice this day. They will go up to heaven and report good news. And thus they will say, There were some in the parishes of Ottenleck, Douglas and Crawford John with, that were receiving our Lord in the office of the gospel and he has become their Lord and this will be welcome news. Now that was Richard Cameron preaching in the open air, exhorting the people as hell-deserving sinners, which we all are, to trust in Christ, the one who bore the guilt of sin and the wrath of God in the place of men and women, to trust in him. The fact that they'd risked so much coming to hear the gospel didn't mean they were Christians. And he says, will you take him? Will you have this Christ? And that's how these men preached, with the threat of death constantly upon them. Cameron, Richard Cameron, ultimately renounced the authority of the king, and rightly so. He said the king was not the king, because he'd broken the constitution which formed the basis on which he was made king. And eventually the rest of the country woke up 
at the time of the revolution settlement and they chased, chased James out of it. But Cameron was saying that before the rest of the country was saying it. Well, in Ireland, the persecution was not so fierce. But most of the Presbyterian ministers refused to submit to government by bishops. 61 of the 68 Presbyterian ministers were deposed. And as I said earlier, during this period, uh, the Solemn League and Covenant had to be sworn by anyone entering the Presbyterian ministry. Presbyterianism in Ireland was originally Covenanter. Then the king gave a toleration, but gradually as the spiritual life declined among the Presbyterians, they became embarrassed about the Solemn League and Covenant. They didn't reject it, they just didn't want it mentioned because they knew the king and his, those in authority didn't like it. But there was one minister, David Houston, and he didn't forget about it. He preached up the covenants that it was the duty of individuals and of the nation to acknowledge Christ and to fulfill the obligations of the Solemn League and Covenant. And uh, David Houston was a faithful minister. James Rennick, the Scottish Covenanter, who knew him well, says, As for Mr. David Houston, he carries very straight. I think him both learned and zealous. He seems to have much of the spirit of our early professors, for he opposes much the passing from any part of our testimony and sticks close to every form and order whereunto we have attained. So the Presbyterians in Ireland and in the northern parts ultimately divided between those who, like Houston, said, no, we want the whole covenant of position and those who wanted to forget about these covenants. And that ultimately led to the uh, division of Presbyterianism into what is now known as the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Ireland that maintained the covenants and the Presbyterian Church of Ireland which set them aside. And uh, that division became formal, uh, especially after the revolution settlement under William of Orange. What about the revolution settlement? We're nearly finished now. The Covenanters were thankful that the persecution came to an end. But they were not happy with the revolution settlement. For several reasons, including the following. First of all, the revolution settlement allowed uh, men who had even helped the persecution, who had conformed to episcopacy, who hadn't been faithful to the covenanted obligations that they'd undertaken when they took the covenant. In other words, it let the compromisers, it let men who were unsound, it let men who hadn't stood fast, and even men who helped the persecution became office bearers in the church simply by signing the Westminster Confession of Faith with no acknowledgement of wrongdoing. Secondly, it allowed Presbyterian Church government in Scotland, government by elders rather than ministers and ruling elders rather than by a hierarchy of officers. It allowed it, but not because it was of divine right, but simply because that's what the people liked, whereas in England there was episcopacy, a hierarchical form of church government. Thirdly, the revolution settlement ignored the covenants and the claims of Christ's kingship over church and state. Fourthly, it allowed wicked men into positions of power. The Covenanters didn't, didn't agree with that. Fifthly, it saw the state, it gave the state a say in the government of the church. 
even at the time of the Revolution Settlement, even in Scotland, the heritors, the landowners, had a, a controlling say in which ministers came to which congregations. Later on, in 1712, I think it is, the Patronage Act took that further, and that led ultimately to divisions in the Church of Scotland, the disruption of 1843, and so on. Whereas the Covenanters, the consist continuing Covenanters, rejected the Revolution Settlement. If I may dare say it in these premises, they, they regarded the Revolution Settlement as not Protestant enough. Uh, I know that it's customary to think of the Revolution Settlement as the epitome of Protestantism, but they didn't see it as Protestant enough. They saw it as a compromise from the stand that they took, the scriptural stand, uh, during the times of persecution. Well, the relevance today. Uh, and if I haven't upset you enough already, perhaps I'll manage it now. Uh, first of all, Christ still reigns at the right hand of God. That hasn't changed. Christ is still at the right hand of the Father. Secondly, Christ should still be, should still be acknowledged as king over the church and over the state. That is the duty of us individually. It's the duty of the church. It's the duty of the nation to acknowledge Christ as the king. Thirdly, that obligation to do so is heightened by the fact that the solemn league and covenant was sworn by the rulers of the three kingdoms uh, as well as multitudes of the people in 1643 and 1644. That swearing of the covenant put additional obligation upon the three kingdoms to own Christ as the rightful king in church and state. That obligation stands even in 2008. And fourthly, the current mess is to be traced back to the rejection of what the Covenanters stood for. I know there's a lot of debate about power sharing. The Covenanters would not have shared power in the sense of joint decision making with anyone who didn't acknowledge Christ as king. And uh, the present situation is simply a very graphic uh, stage of a compromise that goes right back to 1688. It was never right and the fruits of it are becoming all the more ghastly as time goes on. What is needed is for the people of God themselves and to exhort the people to turn to Christ and to acknowledge Christ and only Christ as the rightful ultimate king not only of the church but of the nation. That's what's needed. A complete overhaul of the whole thing. The Covenanters didn't say, even in 1688, they didn't say, we'll settle for the best available. That wasn't how the Covenanters operated at all. And that's why when the king offered 
at the, during the killing times, if only you'll acknowledge my supremacy over the church, I'll not interfere too much. But they wouldn't have it. The alternative for some of them to accepting the compromise was death. There is always, always an alternative to sin. And the covenanters gave their lives sooner than settle for what dishonored Christ. And we need to get back to that principled position of acknowledging Christ as King and refusing any compromise with anything less. They did not do deals with wicked men. They said, Christ must be honoured in the church, in the state. If you don't want to do that, we'll not participate in it. And that's why even when the revolution settlement came and it didn't measure up to the Christ-honouring standards of the covenants, they said, no, we don't want it. And they refused to acknowledge the rightness of the constitution of the nation. Christ must be glorified on earth by his people. You know, in our individual lives and in every aspect of life, what is a Christian's duty? It's not to work out what will work or what he thinks will work. It's to work out what's right and do it and leave the consequences with God. An unbelieving generation cannot do that. But those who believe that there is a sovereign God of heaven who governs everything, they can say, as Samuel Rutherford did say, duties are ours, consequences are God's. Do what's right and leave the outcome with God. Our man-made unprincipled fixes never actually work in the end. We must do what is honouring to Christ and nothing else. Amen. Thank you. Would you like me to close with prayer? Perhaps we should stand for prayer. O gracious and eternal God, we bless and worship Thee. We thank Thee, O Lord, that Thou hast preserved the testimony to Thy truth in all generations, a seed to serve Thee and to magnify Thy name. We thank Thee for the many privileges that have come down to us, the Holy Scriptures in our hands and the testimony of faithful servants in former generations. Enable us, O God, uh, to follow those who through faith have inherited the promises. Look upon us, O God, and bless thy truth to us. Accept our thanks for food and drink and for all thy mercies to us. Bless our further time together and that we might honour Christ in it. Take away our sins and forgive us freely, freely through Christ Jesus and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.